Bubbling Well Road by Rudyard Kipling. Look out on a large scale map of the place where the Chinab River falls into the Indus, five miles or so above the hamlet of Chahuran. Five miles west of Chahuran lies Bubbling Well Road and the house of the Gozain, or priest, of Arti Goth. It was the priest who showed me the road, but it is no thanks to him that I am able to tell this story. Five miles west of Chahrum is a patch of the plumbed jungle grass that turns over in silver when the wind blows, from ten to twenty feet high and from three to four, squa squa four, three to four miles square. In the heart of the patch hides the Gosain of Bubbling Well Road. The villagers stone him when he peers into the daylight, although he is a priest and he runs back again as a stray wolf turns into the tall crops. He is a one-eyed man and carries, burnt between his eyebrows, the impress of two copper coins. Some say that he was tortured by a native prince in the old days, for he is so old that he must have been capable of mischief in the days of Runjit Singh. He is most pressing, his most pressing need at present is a halter, and the care of the British government. These things happen when the jungle grass was tall, and the villagers of the Chukuran told me that a sounder of, sounder of pig had gone into the Artigoth patch. To enter jungle grass is always an unwise proceeding, but I went, partly because I knew nothing of pig hunting, and partly because the villagers said that the big boar of the sounder owned foot-long tusks. Therefore, I wish to shoot him in order to produce the, the, tush, the tusks in after years and say that I had ridden him down in a fair chase. I took a gun and went into the hot, close patch, believing that it would be an easy thing to unearth one pig in ten square miles of jungle. Mr. Wardle, the terrier, went with me because he believed that I was incapable of existing an hour without his advice and countenance. He managed to slip in and out between the grass clumps, but I had to force my way, and in twenty minutes was as completely lost as though I had been in the heart of Central Africa. I did not notice this at the first, till I had grown wearied of stumbling and pushing through the grass, and Mr. Wardle was beginning to sit down very often and hang out his tongue very far. There was nothing but grass everywhere, and it was impossible to see two yards in any direction. The grass stems held the heat exactly as boiler tubes do. In half an hour, when I was devoutly wishing that I had left the big boar alone, I came to a narrow path which seemed to be which seemed to comprise between a native footpath and a pig run. It was barely six inches wide, but I could slide along it in comfort. The grass was extremely thick here, and where the path was ill-defined, it was necessary to crush into the tussocks either with both hands before the face or back into it, leaving both hands free to manage the rifle. Nonetheless, it was a path, and valuable because it might lead to a place. At the end of nearly fifty yards of fairway, just when I was preparing to back into an unusually stiff tussock, I missed Mr. Wardle, who, for his girth, is an unusually frivolous dog, and never keeps to heel. I called him three times and said aloud, where has that little beast got to, gone to? Then I stepped backward several paces, for almost under my feet a deep voice repeated, Where has the little beast gone? To, my appreci to appreciate an unseen voice thoroughly, you should hear it when you are lost in stifling jungle grass. I called to Mr. Wardle again, and the underground echo assisted me. At that I ceased calling, and listened very attentively, because I thought I heard a man laughing in a peculiarly offensive way. The heat made me sweat, but the laughter made me shake. There is no earthly need for laughter in high grass. It is indecent as well as impolite. The chuckling stopped, and I took courage and continued to call till I thought I had located the echo somewhere behind and below the tussock into which I was preparing to back just before I lost Mr. Wardle. I drove my rifle up to the triggers between the grass stems in a downward forward direction. Then I waggled it to and fro, but it did not seem to touch the ground on the far side of the tussock as it should have done. 
Every time that I grunted with the exertion of driving a heavy rifle through thick grass, the grunt was faithfully repeated from below, and when I stopped to wipe my face, the sound of low laughter was distinct beyond dis doubting. When I went into the tussock, face first, an inch at a time, my mouth open and my eyes fine, full, and prominent. When I had overcome the resistance of the grass, I found that I was looking straight across a black gap in the ground, that I was actually lying on my chest, leaning over the mouth of a well so deep I could scarcely see the water in it. There were things in the water, black things, and the water was as black as pitch, with blue scum atop. The laughing sound came from the noise of a little spring sprouting halfway down on one side of down one side of the well. Sometimes, as the black things circled round, the trickle from the spring fell upon their tightly stretched skins, and then the laughter changed into a splutter of mirth. One thing turned over on its back as I watched, and drifted round and round the circle of the mossy brickwork with a hand with a hand and half an arm held clear of the water in stiff and horrible flourish, as though it were a very weary guide paid to exhibit the beauties of the place. I did not spend more than a half an hour in creeping round that well and finding the path on the other side. The remainder of the journey I accomplished by feeling every foot of ground in front of me and crawling like a snail through every tussock. I carried Mr. Wardle in my arms, and he licked my nose. He was not frightened in the least, nor was I, but we wished to reach open ground in order to enjoy the view. My knees were loose, and the apple in my throat refused to slide up and down. The path on the far side of the well was a very good one, though boxed in on all sides by grass, and it led me in time to a priest's hut in the center of the little clearing. When the, that priest saw my very white face coming through the grass, he howled with terror and embraced my boots. But when I reached the bedstead set outside his door, I sat down quickly, and Mr. Wardle mounted guard over me. I was not in a condition to take care of myself. When I awoke, I told the priest to lead me into, an o into the open, out of the arty goth patch, and to walk s slowly in front of me. Mr. Wardle hates natives, and the priest was more afraid of Mr. Wardle than of me, though we were both angry. He walked very slowly down a narrow little path, path, path from his hut. That path crossed three paths, such as the one I had come by in the first instance, and every one of these three headed towards the bubbling well. Once we stopped to draw breath, I heard the well laughing to itself alone in the thick grass, and only my need for his service, services prevented my firing both barrels into the priest's back. When we came to the open, the priest crashed back into cover, and I went into the village of Arty Goth, Arty Goth for a drink. It was a pleasant to be able to see the horizon all round, as well as the ground underfoot. The villagers told me that the patch of grass was full of devils and ghosts, all in the service of the priest, and that men and women and children had entered it and had never returned. They said the priest used their livers for purposes of witchcraft. When I asked why he had not told me of this at the outset, they said that they were afraid that they would lose their reward for bringing news of the pig. Before I left, I did my best to see I, before I left, I did my best to set the patch alight, but the grass was too green. Some fine summer day, however, if the wind is favorable, a file of old newspapers and a box of matches will make clear the mystery of the Bubbling Well Road. That is Bubbling Well Road by Rudyard Kipling.